And if we would uh, turn your, um, in your Bibles uh, to the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth, see if we can uh, uh, finish up. I started this study, uh, study here about, I want to say about three years ago, <laughs> and I uh, was going chapter by chapter, and um, it's not that it's been long. Uh, each chapter is just that uh, been, uh, other times that I've come up, I've, I've spoken on uh, other topics. So why don't we uh, open up in, uh, again in, uh, in another word of prayer, if we may. Father, we come before you thanking you for the wonder of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanking you of the Savior that we have, the Redeemer. Father, that has redeemed us unto himself. And all the beauty and the meaning of that word. Father, we... We ask that today, as we draw some principles from Ruth, that we may be encouraged, that we may, may be exhorted, we may be even chastised, but all to be lifted up before you to know the wonder and to know where you draw us to, a place of perfection, a place of rest, a place of tranquility, knowing you. And so we thank you for that. We pray for any visitors among us that may not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their, as their Savior, either here in the auditorium or maybe through YouTube as they're listening in. We pray, Father, that they may come to understand and to know the wonder of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. <clears throat> so we are <clears throat> in Ruth, and this is the... Um, the book that we want to do, I would like to end in chapter 4 and end with the book, if I may. Not that I'm going to exhaust the book in any way, shape, in, 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 in the mind of God, in the words of the Lord, is all so, so impactful and so deep. I need also, like Joe, he got that from me. I think of things, <clears throat> and I'm already I'm saying it while I'm thinking of something else before I say it, and then there goes uh, everything, uh, even my, my, my vocabulary. But I would like to look and begin with providence. And what does providence mean? Let me tell you what it's not. It's not a miracle. A miracle is a, <clears throat> it's a deviation from the known natural realm. It's something that you don't expect, like walking on water, raising the dead, giving sight to the blind, um, by merely just putting mud upon their eyes with a little spittle. Those are miracles. <clears throat> but that's not what providence is. In, uh, in just a, a, a few words, is God taking the natural events and providing a supernatural outcome. Providing the natural events and producing a supernatural outcome. <clears throat> the problem with us is sometimes we don't have, we don't take the time for providence in our lives. <clears throat> we look in our future and we just have a goal, have a mark, but don't have the steps to get there. Don't plan out our lives. God has planned out all of our lives and placed in his law the way to get us there in a natural realm. And we see that, we see that through Ruth. There are many ways to break down each of these chapters and there's a lot of application that we can take out. One of the, one of the things that I did, and this is what I did and what struck me, is faith and faithfulness through each of these chapters. There's a little twist, there's a little difference. The book of Ruth is a book of 88 verses, very short, four chapters. You can sit through it and read, read through the whole book, I can, in about 45 minutes. You'd probably be able to do it in 15, just because I read slow. But it's a great book. It's, all, it's also one of two books in a patriotic society in the Word of God, where two books have a title of a woman. Isn't that awesome? It's the only book 
right? Well, this one, Ruth and Esther. It's the only book with the title of a woman that's a Gentile. It's another tremendous thing. And of course, if we look through and you uh, look at the genealogy that through this woman, we see that the Lord Jesus is going to come through this marriage that we'll see here in Ruth. It is a book that is set, most likely a lot of scholars put them in Judges chapter 10, more or less. You can read through it and see how that fits in on your own. But it's the time of the judges. It's the time of the judges in which it ends with a phrase, in those days where there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so we have there is no rule, there is no law, everyone was, there was no king, and then they, whatever they perceived to be right, that's what they did. Sounds kind of like today. If it feels good, just do it. Well, not really. Not if you want a good society. Judges go into cycles. There are cycles in Judges. There are four cycles that we look in Judges, and it's nothing different here. The first cycle is that of a apostasy, of that of sin, the nation's sin. And then the Lord needs to come in and brings in tribulation through either famine or through uh, invasion of other nations. And then as he uh, judges them, he brings a judge to convict them, brings conviction. And in that conviction, in the fourth cycle, we find repentance. There's a turn to God, and God blesses them. It, this Ruth opens up in, a, in the first cycle. We find that there is a famine in the land. And so there is this family that is focused upon uh, Elimelech, uh, which means my God is king, Naomi, which means my delight or pleasant. <clears throat> they turn and they look towards Moab. You see, it's just too much. There's a famine here. There's no food for our children. Our children uh, is uh, uh, Chilean. There's Melan and Chilean, which means sickly and pining. And so here is this, you know, one that is sick, looking at him, and his baby comes out and he goes, oh, wow, this is sick, and names the kid sick. And then the other one comes out and is crying all the time, so he calls him crier. And so here they are, and they say, man, things are just a disaster. We need a better life. We need to go where the grass is greener on the other side. So if you go outside and there's a big hill, Right, right in the next to the other building. I, mean, I don't know if you guys seen him. And usually, even in drought, it's kind of green. It's pulling nutrients there. Under there, well, when you flush the toilets, that's what's under there. Whatever goes there, that's the nutrients. So if you dig deep enough for something that looks green, you need to be careful. My grandmother, when she came from Cuba, we took a drive, you know, going to our house. We lived right, uh, I think was a... Uh, I believe is Ludham. No, not Ludham. I should have looked this up. It was uh, right there in Little Havana. And we're coming down Flagler, and there is a funeral home on the, on the right-hand side as we were going east. And as she looks down outside the window, she goes, and there's flowers all over. She goes, oh, look, a garden, a beautiful garden. And we laugh. And he goes, no, Grandma, that's... That's a burial ground. They're not used to that in Cuba, to see all these flowers in a burial ground. <clears throat> and we have here um, Elimelech and Naomi with their children, and they pack up and they go, and they go over to Moab. And they're in Moab, and you need to understand that Moab is uh, their supreme deity, their chief deity is Shamash or Kamash, depending how you pronounce it. And that supreme deity is, it requires human sacrifice in order to appease and find its favor. As a matter of fact, we have an example of this event in 2 Kings chapter 3, 27, where Jehoshaphat and the king of Israel uh, go off to fight against Moab, and they go down the bottom to try to surprise him through the land of Edom and pick up the king of Edom there. And these three are the, some trials and situations that take place, but they, uh, through the mercy of God, they go in and they begin to conquer. They begin to do what the Lord tells them to do. And the king of Moab says he took his son upon the gate 
were upon the city wall, and he sacrificed them there to their deity because he was losing the battle. And so this is where they're going. They're going in their minds to a better place, a place to, a, a, of restoration, of new beginning. And yet they were making their home in a burial grounds. They're leaving the promises of God because it got tough. There's a principle here that we need to pull and extract from this verse and these thoughts. The worst time that we find ourselves in the midst of our Lord is better than the best times away from the Lord in this world. That's a principle. And so we're all going to go through trials and tribulation. That's kind of the theme of the men's breakfast yesterday. Trials and tribulation. And James puts it very clear as it, as it was brought out yesterday. Count it all joy, brethren, when you go, when you find yourself into various trials. For there it will work out your patience. And patience, when it had its full, it will give you peace. You will be complete in God. Trials and tribulation, times of suffering. A lot of times we say, oh, why me? Why me? And a lot of times it's because me instigated it. Because me instigated it. And we find that Amalek, in verse 3, dies in this land. And shortly after, we find that the two uh, sons, they marry Orpah and they marry Ruth. And they too, in verse 5, die. And so they go to a place of prosperity, so to speak, but they find that there they were, their home was in the midst of a burial ground. There they, Ruth realizes that the Lord has visited their people. And there's bread back in Jerusalem, back in, 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 um, in um, um, Bethlehem. And so she begins to come back. And here is the main thing or the main focus that we can draw out other many other things. I just wanted to mention those few things first of all. But here we find faith in action in the midst of adversity. Chapter 1, faithfulness in adversity. We find Ruth makes a statement, makes a stand. And down in verse 16, a few sentences down, she takes action and she says, for wherever you go to her, to her mother, in law, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. She makes a statement. And there she makes a commitment in that statement. It says, your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. And uses the word Elohim for the Lord, the all-powerful one. But then she goes on and makes a, she forsakes all her past. And she makes this statement in verse 17. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. She's going to put aside all her things that she's used to, all the things that she's comfortable with, all the foods, the sounds, her parents, her, her, her family. She's going to put all these things away, and she's going to go to a land where the Moabites were looked upon as cursed people where the people didn't want nothing to do with the Moabites. That's where she's going, into the very den of the lion, in the lion's lair. And so she makes a commitment, and then she makes a covenant. She takes an oath. She makes a promise. The Lord, here she uses the name of God, Jehovah, the covenantal name, name of God, the ever-existing one, the great I Am, Jehovah, do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. So she makes a covenant. She makes she trusts herself upon this Jehovah, the one true God of all. And she goes forth. We see the adversity that she's going when Naomi comes into her own land, and the people are there welcoming her. And what, do, what does she say? She says, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant, but call me Mara. Call me bitter. And in verse 21, she says, I went out full, but now I've come back empty. And she comes back with Ruth right next to her. How does she feel? She's nothing. She's valueless. It's what it would portray. But we have 
We have nothing, no comment from Ruth. She stays the course. Are we faithful in times of great disappointment? Are we faithful when there is adversity in our lives? When there is struggle? Do we stay the course? Do I? I fail at times. And I think if we're honest, we all do. But we need to get back up. And we need to get back on the road with our Lord and continue to learn and to study and to grow in him. This is the beginning of barley harvest. So we see that they leave in the famine, but they come back on cycle four. The Lord is blessing. There's a harvest. The famine is over. Chapter two begins with an introduction of one of the key personnels in this chapter, a redeemer, a goel. Not mentioned here, but he's instructed that this is a man of great wealth, of virtue. And his name is Boaz, a family of Elimelech. There's a few things to bring out here. In verse 2, Ruth takes an initiative in this chapter. And I label this chapter faithful diligence. Faithful diligence. She takes action and she looks at what is needed and she moves forward. Yes, there is adversity. Yes, there is hunger. Yes, there is needs. But I need to do something about it. And she moves forward. But she doesn't move forward to do it on her own strength. That's what's important here. Look at verse 2. She asks her, grand, her, her mom, her mother-in-law, if she can go. She asks permission. We see her, her humility. But then she says this, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I might I may find favor. Three times over, this word favor shows. If you have the King James, you may have the word grace, or maybe the word kindness. In the Hebrew, it's chen. It's the word chen. I know that because of the young man you brought last week. So he coached me on how to say it. So I know that, that, that pronunciation is correct. I got it firsthand. And so here we have that she wants to find favor in the sight of this one. She doesn't want to go and glean anywhere. And by the way, the providence of God had already set forth naturally the needs of those who were in destitute, poor, and the foreigners, allowing them to go and glean. Those that were harvesting needed to leave the corners open for them. And whatever they harvested as they move along, they couldn't come back and re-harvest the floor. That was to be whatever dropped and fell was for the people. And so we find here in three ways the law is given out. We see it in Deuteronomy 24. We won't go to it. And that is when it's rehearsing the civil law. So in the civil law, the responsibility of the individual to another, to their countrymen, was to do this, to leave this gleaning for them. But also it's found in Leviticus 23, and that is in the ceremonial law, a responsibility with God was to allow this for the people. God is involved. But there is a third one. I think that's what she meant here. And that is found in, in, in Leviticus 19 and in the rehearsing of the moral law. You must understand that the moral law has to do with the heart of the individual. The Ten Commandments, the moral law, begins God and ends do not covet. That's everything in that moral law. And so she's saying is, I don't want to just simply go with someone who is following a law, but one that desires to show kindness. I want to see it in his sight. And so she left. In verse 3, we see, we, we see this beautiful uh, illustration of providence being brought out in verse 3. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come. Too many times, right? We go through life and saying, oh, that, what a coincidence. I don't think that's a word. Coincidence, right? What a coincidence that these, that happened. Wow, that was awesome. How lucky. <laughs> the province of God. But no, God had planned these out. He said it in the law that these were to be there. And that there needed to be someone 
Someone of great wealth. And so we find one that is very poor and one that is very wealthy going to meet here. And his name is Boaz. And so we have other couple of things that I just want to bring out here. When they meet and he inquires about her, he gets the report. Down into verse 10, uh, after he speaks to her in verse 9, she says, uh, she bows down before him and says this to him in verse 10. Why have I found favor, Chen, in your eyes, kindness, grace? This speaks of his countenance. She looked upon him and she saw that this was a sincere man, that he was giving this grace, this kindness, this Chen. And she saw him. And she saw uh, that it was genuine, that you have taken notice of me since I am a foreigner. You see the stigma that she had. I'm a foreigner. I'm a cursed, I'm a cursed nation, cursed people living in this. And you're taking favor for me? Boaz answered in verse 11. <clears throat> you got to love the response. It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, that is Malan, and how you have left your father and your mother and land of birth and have come to the people, <clears throat> to this people, that is not from your birth. <clears throat> and so we, we find in verse 10, it says, faithful diligence in time of great adversity is not passed by God. He takes notice. And he will providentially bring about a rescuer to you and to me. Verse 12, the Lord repay you, he says to her, these words, which are key. He says, the Lord repay you for your work and full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. So this is from Boaz. He says, may the Lord give you, and what he's saying basically is protection, provision, pleasure. If you go through the Psalms, this is what you read concerning this phrase, that the Lord spread his wing over you. If you want a reference, you can look up Psalm 17, Psalm 36, and Psalm 63, and read through it, and you see this, the wing covering Offering protection, provision, and pleasure. And so he takes notice of her. He invites her to have a meal with him and then sends her off with grain to go back uh, uh, to her mom. Actually provides ease of gleaning. Gleaning in the word of God has, is very difficult to go and glean grain in the field. Especially if you're not cutting it and harvesting it and wrapping it and then taking it to a threshing floor where you need then to process it and then do the winnowing, throwing it up in the air to, so the shaft can separate and so you can get the grain and then and so on. Gleaning had to do going down and picking one, two, and three at a time, up and down, up and down, up and down. And so gleaning from God's word takes time, it's consuming, it's study, it's looking in backgrounds, defining words, seeing how it was originally used, and then putting it in its context. It's laborious, but it's gratifying when you see the hand of God in it. So he brings her, and he invites her, and he sends her off. She goes, and... She, and, and um, Naomi takes notice in verse 20 as we go and move into chapter 3. And she says to her, Blessed be the Lord God who has taken notice. Know what she says. Has not forsaken his kindness. Here is not hen, it's chesed. Chesed. And here is not just simply the kindness of God, but the loving kindness of God, the, love, the, the loyal love of God, the steadfast love of God. It's the godliness that cares and provides and gives. She's looking for kindness, for favor, for grace. God is giving beyond and above. Naomi here realizes what's going on. And so she says, and this man is one of our close relatives. He is a next of kin. He is a goel. 
is a kinsman redeemer, one of them. She knows her family or um, um, her husband's family line. And so this chapter kind of closes out, but then begins with her mom kind of thinking of what all these things can entail. And so chapter three is one of those chapters you say, what? You're telling her to do what? Naomi is going to advise her to go and present him herself to Boaz in a very particular way. What we find in chapter three is very practical. God speaks when he speaks to us in very practical terms. And things that we enjoy and things that we like and things how we are made. Know what he he says to to, to her. She says, my daughter, shall I not seek uh, security? That is, shall I not seek rest for you? In verse 1. That it may be well with you. Now, Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not a relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So he is gathering the grain, right? This is an awesome time. The harvest has been brought in, and now they're winnowing. They've got the grain. They have crushed the grain upon a prior wheel. An ox went around in this flat surface, hard surface, where they break the shaft, and then they winnow, they throw the shaft up into the air where the wind takes it and the grain falls and then they gather the rain and they begin to pile it up in a heap. And this is what's taking place. It's a very joyous time in the nation of Israel. To seek security, to seek rest is to find a home for you. It means a place of dwelling. To find a home is a place and should be a place of rest. If it's not, we need to work because it's not easy. It's laborious. There's a work of faith, but there's a labor of love. And love takes time. It's hard. And sometimes it goes against our nature because we're selfish. And so there's this labor that we need to be involved in. And so she wants to make a home for her. Now Boaz, in verse 2, she sees, she connects the line, she sees the sparkle. She sees the interest, one with the other. And she says to her, whose young women you were with is, a, is, is now relative fact, is winnowing barley at this time. Verse 3, therefore, here's a practical advice. Wash, put on your best garment, put on some perfume. Go and wait till he drank, he's drunk, he, he's well drunk, and that, he, that doesn't mean that he's intoxicated, that he has drunk and that he has eaten, right? His belly is full. He's in a good mood. Then you're going to go and you're going to do something very interesting. You say, what, 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 what's going on here? Well, to get the attention of a man, ladies, we need to look good, right? It, I like my wife looking good, um, uh, dressing up, and so on and so forth. Now, we keep in mind that this is, it's not, what she's not asking is to go and to allure him in a sensual way. And most likely, she has been wearing her widow's garments. It doesn't say so. This is my thinking. Okay? It's my thinking. And so she takes off the widow's garment, I would think. And she puts on garments that would be attractive, that would show and say, I'm no longer a widow. I'm available. And then she goes and says, and when you get there and you, he's already drunk, in other words, and eaten, his stomach is full. It's the worst thing, the worst time to go come up to a man when he comes in from work. Uh, when he is hungry and is in, and he hasn't had anything to drink and he just wants to sit down and just relax for a little bit, well, he doesn't want to be told everything that's gone, gone on. He doesn't want a chatterbox at that time. He wants quietness. He wants a time to relax, to find rest in his home. And then after he has eaten, then come and speak to him and tell him the events of the day. 
But we find here that she gives practical advice, but then one that is kind of weird says, when you get there and he, you find where he sleeps, in verse 4, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you should do. That's kind of like, you know, kind of weird, right? You would think, you say, wow, I mean, what kind of advice is this? Of course, we got to go back to that time. we got to go back to that society. I don't recommend to anyone to do this, to break into somebody's home and then uncover his feet and lie down there. Don't do that. But here, there is a purpose, there's a reason. What she's doing is she's proposing to him. It's a marriage proposal is what it is. And so, and the beauty of it, here's this foreigner from another, like for her own admission, from Moab, not too familiar with these customs. What does she do? And what does she say? Both. Verse 5 and 6. And she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor, and she did, according to what he said. In other words, there's faithful obedience. There's faithfulness in adversity. There's faithfulness in taking action and diligence. But then there's also faithfulness in obedience. Sometimes we don't understand why. But God says so, and so we do it. Faithfulness. In obedience. And so he sets, she sets this matchmaking, right? Fiddler on the Roof. If you haven't seen it, go see it. All right? Great movie. Gotta look at it and it's a movie. <laughs> okay, but it's it's pretty funny. At any rate, here's this matchmaker. She's making a match for her uh, 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 daughter in law. And when he sees what it is, he, he's, he's startled there in verse 9. Who are you, he says. So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant. And look what she says, under your wing, for you are a close relative. Ezekiel chapter 16 kind of tells us what that means, that this is a marriage proposal in the eyes of God towards the nation. And you take your time, you can go there, and you can read about it in chapter 16 of Ezekiel, down to verse 8. But here she says, you know, she wants to be her, she's her main servant under your wings, for you are a close relative. You are a goel, you are a redeemer. <clears throat> what did he say? Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown me kindness. Not hen, but chesed. She has shown him the kindness of God demonstrated to her mother-in-law. This is weird. You're a foreigner from someplace else, a mother-in-law? And, and he says, I've been watching you, and your kindness is not that of an individual, a person, or any human, but your kindness is a kindness of God, a loving kindness, a loving faithfulness, persistent Seen in her obedience. Did not go after the young man, but went after the goel of the time. And so this goes through this chapter and is going to come to this point where uh, he says, I'm going to do what you ask me, but there is one that is closer than I as a redeemer, the one that has the right to redeem. And I will take care of this. I will not rest. When she comes home and sees her mother-in-law, she says this in verse 18 that brings us into chapter 4. And I know we got five minutes, and I will try to get through this in that time. She says to him, then she, she says to her in verse 18, sit Still, there's another aspect of faith that we need to exercise. Not just simply in times of adversity or times that, that we need to step out and do and work and be diligent in it. Not other times we just need to obey and, and although we don't understand it, but also in the time that we just simply have done all that we could and now we rest, and we have the confidence that he will take care of it. 
And so she is faithful in patience. She's patient. The word sit here means to go home and just sit down in your dwelling place. Just relax. There's nothing else that you can do. Our salvation in, the, in, in, in our Lord is done. There's nothing that I can do further to further my position in Christ. He's done it all. It's done. The Thessalonians, right? When Paul remembered their, 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 their faith, um, their, their work of faith, their labor of love, and their patience of hope. Patience. The Lord is coming. There's a hope for us, no matter what we're going through. And so there's this rest. So now in verse 4, we find, at, we find that Ruth takes a back seat. She is just resting. She, is, she has faithful patience that he would do what he would do, that, that he said that he would do. And Boaz goes and he goes to the gate. And he sat down. There's a lot of sitting that happens here in this chapter. A lot of sitting around. But it's very important. He goes to the gate. And the gate in the Old Testament, as you go through your Bible from Genesis all the way through, it's a very important place. It's a place of social activity. The city gates is where business takes care. Right? Where governments sit. Where the news of the outside comes in and is there. Uh, in Psalms, that talk about is where wisdom is heralded, where the multitude and the citizens come and they see. And this is what's taking place here. He's sitting there and he calls. Uh, he sees the friend in verse 1. That is John Doe. You can say so-and-so. A book that is rich in names and its meaning, as we already saw and as we'll see, or you can see as you read through uh, chapter 4, we find that this man is not even mentioned. He's just simply John Doe. Sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. And he took ten men from the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So he sat down. And then he goes through this thing and he says, here's Naomi that came down from uh, Moab. Uh, and she had a plot of land that she had to sell. Would you redeem it? You're, uh, I'm next after you as a kingsman redeemer. Would you redeem it? And he says, yes. I'll take the land. He goes, ah, but there's something else. There's a young lady that's with him from Moab. And when you redeem the land, you need then to marry her to bring up seed for the dead. So there's a leveraged marriage that takes on here. We're not going to have time to finish. I have to pick this up here in this chapter next time that, we're, that, that we come to it. But here is a wonderful... Um, um, events that take place concerning this kinsman redeemer. That is a legal term. There's, uh, there are three requirements and maybe even a fourth requirement of the kinsman redeemer. And we mentioned that this morning. There's a legal right uh, to propitiate, to satisfy the law. So he needs to meet that law. And so we see it in this Kingsman Redeemer. There's one that meets that requirement before Boaz. Secondly, he has to be able to pay a debt. He has to be able to pay. And this first Kingsman is able to pay the debt. But there's a third. He needs to be willing. And so when he brings up the fact of this Moabitess, the Ruth the Moabitess, to take as wife for the dead, to propitiate the name of the dead through his inheritance, and there's a lot there as well. <clears throat> he says, um, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. And there's several, several thoughts concerning why he couldn't and why he mentions this. One, maybe he was thinking there's a Moabitess woman. She's a, a, a cursed nation, a cursed individual. And I'm going to bring that home. Maybe she is married already and maybe has daughters. And he brings in this one that just to fulfill the law and to bring up a, a, a child by her for the dead. And if it's a boy, in Deuteronomy 21, it says, if you have two wives, 
One you love and one you do not. But the one that you love has the firstborn male. Then you will give him a double portion of your inheritance. Or he will mar his inheritance because of that. He's not willing to do it. But there is a fourth also that was brought up to my attention. And that is the fact that even willing, he has to be willing even to that point to mar his inheritance. This man was not. But we find that Boaz was. And so he takes this guy's sandal, and there's a lot there, and he says, the deal has been done in the, in the title deed for the property and the redemption of Ruth is, is accomplished. Now that's a picture of our Lord, and we won't have time now to go into it. Next time that I speak, I will deal with that topic. But for us here today, and for those maybe watching later on, there is a need, all of us. The, the story of Ruth is not about a young woman from Moab that came over to Israel and all her faithfulness and all her wonder. Ruth is not just simply this woman in, the, in, in, this, in this passage. And you may say, well, look at how backwards they are, how they treated the women. That's not in God's eyes. Ruth, it's you and me. Ruth is us, and all of us need a redeemer. And all of us have lost the deeds to this world. And we are lost and will be lost forever if it wasn't and if it isn't for the Redeemer, our Lord and our Savior, our Goel. He has redeemed us by his blood. This morning was about that theme. We sang it even from this pulpit. He is our Redeemer. The question is, is he yours? Have you put your trust and faith in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you made him his, your own personal goel? For you are a foreigner. You are apart from the commonwealth of Israel. You are away from the protection of God. If you don't have him as your savior. We don't come here to play church. It's not our focus. Our focus is to learn of him and to grow in him. And if we don't know him, to put our trust and faith in him, that he may indwell you and then live, and live through him, that you may, in you, in me, may be seen the hesed of God, like Boaz saw in Ruth. Are you Ruth? Are you faithful? Am I? in adversity, in diligence, in obedience, and in patience with our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Bring conviction, we ask, like only you can, by thy spirit. In, his, in your precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.